Having established to his satisfaction that the objects of thought are independent of our acts of thinking and that the nature of thinking needs to be explained in terms of the properties of the objects of our thought, he now turns to the question of truth. That is to say, what are our objects of thought have to do with the world? The objects of our thought are concepts, and Moore is going to come to the surprising conclusion that the world is composed of concepts. So how does Moore come to this? Well, concepts are mind independent. That's what he's established against the idealist. That is to say, the concepts are what they are, whether or not anyone has ever thought about them. The concept of a pen is what it is, whether or not I've ever thought about the concept of a pen, whether or not you've ever thought of the concept of the pen, and so on and so forth. Now, concepts by themselves aren't able to plug us up to the world because concepts aren't true or false. The concept pen isn't true or false until I combine that concept with some other concept, say, the pen is white. Now I've combined the concept of a pen with the concept of whiteness, and I've made a statement that can actually be true or false. It's either the case that the pen is white and the concepts enter into uh, together into a truth, or it's not the case and the concepts have been put together in a way that's false. So concepts are mind-independent things that enter into propositions. Those propositions are then true or false. Here's another example. The concept human and animal come together into the proposition, the human being is an animal. So by combining concepts together, we form propositions, that is, judgments about reality. Thus, through Moore's critique of the idealist theory of judgment, and indeed of Kant and Bradley's theory of judgment, he initiates one of the central problems of analytic philosophy. What is the nature of a proposition, and how do concepts enter together into propositions such that propositions can be true or false? One of the most important problems in the philosophy of language. Notice a pop proposition is not merely a word, or a sentence, the very same proposition, the very same meaning can be expressed by different sentences. Say, if I say it in English and you say it in German, we're expressing the same proposition through different words, different sentences. The word human has five letters in it, but the concept of human doesn't have any letters in it. It's a concept. We use the word to denote the concept. Moore's answer to the question of what makes concepts into propositions is rather unsatisfactory, though very simple. For Moore, a proposition is a complex concept. That is to say, it is just more than one concept put together. But that's not clear. It takes more than putting concepts together to form a proposition that can be true or false. The question becomes, what is the nature of truth and how do propositions have purchase in truth? It's important that, again, we push the notion of truth as a mind-independent feature of reality and not merely, say, a psychological state of conviction. Truth is not something that's dependent on my mental states, but rather something mind-independent out there in the world. Ultimately, Moore takes a kind of platonic turn here. He thinks that truth is a kind of primitive concept, one that we can't really further analyze and merely have put some kind of insight into as human beings. That's why Moore ultimately rejects the correspondence theory of truth. You might have thought that truth is when our concepts or our words or something else lines up or corresponds to what really exists. For example, when my word the pen, when my words, there is a pen, correspond to what really exists, the pen, I've said something true. But that means we have to think of truth in terms of simpler concepts, namely existence. But if we turn to the question of what exists, Moore says that existence itself can only be defined in terms of truth. So it's the other way around. Truth is somehow more basic than the concept of existence. So defining truth in terms of existence isn't going to work. 
Moore settles by biting the bullet and saying truth is a kind of basic pro basic thing. It's the most fundamental notion of logic, and we have a direct and immediate insight into it. For more than existence is a logically privileged concept, and for something to exist in the world is for it to have a conceptual relation to the concept of existence. So for more, the world is formed out of concepts because truth is a property of propositions. Propositions are ultimately uh, formed of constituent concepts. This sort of hyper-conceptual realism might appear bizarre. So why does more hold to it? Well, again, he's trying to push the objects of our thought out into a mind-independent external world, and he thinks Kant's theory of judgment fails to do that, that is, makes the objects of our thought dependent somehow on mental faculties. Kant, of course, divides the mental faculties up into intuition and understanding. So Kant's theory of judgment and how it makes reference to the objects makes essential reference to these mental faculties, and that's what Moore wants to avoid. Notice, for Kant, intuition or perception is a direct reference to the things in the world, and the form of space and time is the form of intuition. The things that come into intuition are given form in space and time, and then we apply judgments to them using the understanding with such a priori categories as substance and causality, so that any reference to the external world somehow involves time, space, substance, and causality, for Kant considered as categories of these mental faculties. On the other hand, Moore wants to make it the case that particular judgments, such as a mortal human exists, do as a matter of their conceptual necessity, imply the concept of time, because the concept of existence implies the concept of time. So the sense in which our references to particular things in the world implies time and space is not that time and space are categories of some mental faculty of intuition, it's just that there's this a priori relation between concepts. So the question shifts into the register of philosophy of language, philosophy of proposition, and how concepts relate together in an a priori fashion. It's just part of the concept of existence that it implies the concept of time. To exist is to take up some portion of time. So empirical propositions, like a mortal human exists, that's the kind of thing that we need to actually observe empirically, just has these a priori conceptual relations to the concept of time. So the a priori doesn't reside in mental faculties, but in the mind-independent relations between concepts. On the other hand, our a priori judgments which for Kant are primarily judgments having to do with the relations between categories in the faculty of understanding and intuition, are instead propositions that don't have any ultimate conceptual a priori entailment to the concept of time. So notice when we make a a priori proposition, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, our concepts don't connect up to the concept of time. So 2 plus 2 equals 4 is not a temporal proposition, it's true at all times, and at no point do the concepts of two, four, addition, or equality make some, any reference to a temporal mode of existence. The upshot, the ultimate result, is that we can develop a theory of judgment that makes absolutely no reference to the mind or the world. The ground of true judgments, whether a priori or empirical, is the mind-independent nature of concepts and the interconceptual relations between them.